I hear so many Christians murmuring about their imperfections and their failures and their addictions and their shortcomings. And I see so little war. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Why am I this way? Make war! Bang with me, bang, 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 bang with me. Never yeah. playing games like it's a stain. You get risky. So man, if you in Christ, take up your cross quickly. Yeah. Feel it's on the front line. Time to come with it. Hey. Do the right thing. Wake up. Next week, I'm just going to wrap that. I think I can do it. I don't know. Maybe I should try it. <laughs> have you recovered from daylight savings yet? Uh, hopefully you have. I tell you what, I don't, I don't know why we do that. Only the federal government believes you can cut a foot off at the top of the blanket and sew it back at the bottom of the blanket, and you have a longer blanket. <laughs> uh, you know, but hopefully you've recovered from that and are excited to be here today. I know I am excited about what God's doing here in, uh, in Emmanuel Baptist Church and through Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, we're, we're issuing several challenges during March Madness. And so the first week, if you were here, we challenge you to pray for five people that need to be at Emmanuel for Easter. We believe God so loves this area, and He loves the entire world so much. He loves the tri-county area so much that we need to invite everyone. That God wants everyone to know His love to experience His grace and mercy. And so we're praying for those five people. If you weren't here, maybe you can start that today. You're going to be praying for those five people. And then last week, uh, we said, hey, let's do some random acts of kindness. Let's begin just to kind of cultivate the field. And so what many of you did, just some crazy things this past week, if you saw the videos on YouTube and Facebook, some of you were out cleaning bath, public bathrooms. I mean, just showing up at gas stations and businesses and saying, hey, we're here to clean your bathroom. You know, like, what are you here for? You know, but, but they went in and they did it and had a small group go to a laundromat and just love on people and help them out. And, and just hearing some great stories. Guys, keep it up. Keep it up. We're doing random acts of kindness that we might just be a, a visual example of what the love of God looks like. The love of God does spontaneous, crazy things that no one else would do. That it might open up the door for the gospel to travel. So what's the challenge this week? I'm glad you asked. This week, we want you to invite, invite, invite. In fact, at the conclusion of the service today, at the back of the auditorium and out in the foyer, we have these invite cards for you. Now, we're only going to give you three, okay? You get three invite cards, and you can pick them up. We've got a small group that's going to distribute those after the worship service this morning. And the challenge is, is to hand these out to three people and say, listen, somebody that you know that doesn't go to church, someone who's not a believer, and you're going to go to them this week, and you're going to hand it to them and say, listen, I want to invite you to our church for Easter. Uh, we have a service on uh, uh, Saturday at 5. You can come out you, if you work third shift, uh, if you work Sundays or you just can't get up Sundays, come on out on Saturday. It's going to be the exact same worship service, or you can come Sunday morning at 1045. And guess what? This is, this is brand new stuff. Okay, brand new. We're going to have a service on Friday in Spanish. So if you speak Spanish, at Friday at 7, or you know some folks, uh, we're going to have a worship service in Spanish. So pray for me. i got two weeks to learn Spanish. Um, actually, we've got some folks here, Tino and Savannah. You guys know them and love them. They're going to, they're going to help us out with that. So we're throwing in a third service. It's going to be crazy. I want you to be a part of it. Be praying. So this week, it's invite, invite, invite. Here at Emmanuel... We've been making war the past three weeks. This is the third sermon in a four-week series, and we've been making war. Now, hopefully, you've been fighting the battle. Because what I know for a fact is the enemy's been fighting you. you you've had spiritual forces coming against you. You've had temptations. You've had struggles. You've had disappointments come your way. And there's a battle raging against you. So the question is, have you been fighting back? Have you been fighting the battles in your life over sin, habitual sin that tends to come in and takes our, our lives over? The temptation, have you been fighting those battles? Have you been waging war 
over the sin in your life. Week one, we looked at a passage in Romans, and I'll, if you'll turn on your, to your outline in the back of your bulletin, you'll see Romans 7, verse 22 and 23. The Bible says, For in my in, inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war. Underline that on your outline. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. In my, it's in my body. In my mind, and in my, in my makeup, chemical makeup, there's, there's a battle that's raging, a, a raging war trying to destroy me. And then last week we looked in James. James chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? It's not the source, your pleasures that wage war. Underline wage war again, in your members. And then 1 Peter 2, 11, the Bible says, Beloved, that's those that are believers, those that are born again. We are beloved by God. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. So the Bible calls us to wage war because there's a battle that's being fought against us. There are casualties that fall every day in the Christian community and we fall into temptation and we give in to temptation and fall into sin and, and begin to destroy and wreck our lives, our homes, our marriages. It steals our joy. And so we need to fight back. The first week, we gained an understanding of what it means to fight back. We fight back by dying to self. In the book of Romans, it tells us that if you, if you have died, then you're free from sin. In other words, sin has no right over the believer. It has no legal right over the believer. We do not have to sin as born-again believers. We have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we can walk in that freedom. Last week, we learned the process of war. That if we're going to wage this battle, we need to understand there's a process. First, we're confronted by our sin, either by the Holy Spirit, the Bible, a friend, a stranger. But we don't like to listen to that. We don't like to think that we've done wrong, but that's the first step. We're confronted by an outside source about our own sin. And then conviction comes. And when conviction comes, we've got to say, yes, that is right. I was wrong. And then the, the third, the third is confession. We need to confess. We need to take an immediate action step. In fact, this week, some of you made an immediate action step. To turn from sin and to turn to God. And then finally, the fourth in that process, if you'll remember from last week, is that we're cleansed. That when we confess, when we repent, the Bible says He is faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of the gospel, that when we repent and humble ourselves before an almighty God, He forgives us and He cleanses us. And those that we were like crimson, we become like wool. That's the beauty of the gospel. It erases all sin, past, present, and future, under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today, today is an important message that we all need to hear on demolishing strongholds. We each have habitual sin in our life that's developed a stronghold in our life, a fortress that holds us captive. It's a sin that, it's a habitual sin we just can't break. It's a thought it's an attitude. I'd encourage you to go back and watch the other sermons, but for today, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We see here that Paul lays out a clear distinction, a clear distinction between existing in the world and living like the world lives. It, it should not be the same. Paul does not deny our human weakness, our sinful nature, our propensity to sin and and our shortcomings. But he also affirms that we need to fight this battle. That it is a spiritual batter, battle that, wa that we wage. And we fight with spiritual weapons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Beginning in verse 1 the Bible says. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ I appeal to you. I Paul who am timid when face to face with you. But bold went away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think they live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power 
to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. The world, what what is he talking about? Depending on your translation, it will say either world or flesh. What What is he talking about? The world or unbelievers, those that have not been born again. Uh, th- those that have, have not given their lives to Christ, that are those in the world. But the world or the flesh is also the system that is out there. Those things the world s- says is right. Those things the world says uh, are, are true or false. It can, be, it can be called a worldview. How we perceive truths around us. How, how, how we look at actions. How we deem if something is good or bad. And we all have a different worldview. And if you're a believer, the, the world's worldview, it's like glasses that have been taken off. And when you become a believer, you put on new glasses. And you have a new worldview. And that worldview is determined by the Bible. What God says is right. What God says is wrong. And so Paul is delineating here for us that there is a way that the world says is right, but is actually wrong. He says we need to live by God's standard. And he's writing to the church at Corinth here. And number one on your outline, we need to understand what standards are you living by. As he writes to the church at Corinth, the church at Corinth would have been a lot like the United States. Uh, there, were, there was a polytheistic mindset. There were many different religions. There was a secular humanist worldview that, that really said that man was the answer to all of our problems. It was... To leave each person alone to whatever they believe. There there really wasn't an absolute truth. But there were many truths. And whatever you were really passionate about. That was okay for you. But I might have a different belief. And so in many ways. This is true for the United States. In the day and age that we live in. The church has always been. And people were always prone. To drift towards the cultural norm. Whatever the cultural norm is. We tend to fall into that pattern because it's what everybody else is doing. We like to blend in. We like to fit in. We're socialized through school and through friendships, through media, uh, through publications, through movies we watch. And we have this influence from the time we're babies until we're adults. And, and, and it's influenced us in our perception and our worldview, what we feel like is right or wrong, instead of sticking to biblical truth. This is how I often hear it. Everyone's doing it. <laughs> Parents, have you ever heard that from your kids? Everyone's doing it. You know, everyone's wearing it. I heard a quote from Marilyn Monroe this week. I don't know if it was her, but Robin was telling me about it. And I just thought, man, it'd be fun to quote Marilyn Monroe. So I'm going to say it's, it's from her. Although I kind of wonder. She said, well, wear your clothes, ladies, tight enough so they know you're a woman but loose enough so they know you're a lady. Now, she's probably not the best person to take fashion advice from. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, you know, young girls come. So everybody's showing cleavage, Mom. You know, everybody's wearing them this tight. or the, All the dresses are this short. That's what Paul's getting at. This is, this is often what we hear. Or, or say, everybody talks like that. You know, it's, it's why I work at the railroad and everybody uses those superlatives. And that's what everybody's doing. Or say, everyone is dating or everyone cheats on their taxes. You know, I, I want to get my fair share. You know, everybody else is on the draw. I, I want to get some, I want to get mine. I want to get mines. That's what we say in Louisville. You know, I want to get mines. You know. And it's justified because everyone else is doing it. Because the world's doing it, it makes it acceptable for me. Because the world dresses that way, it's okay for me and my kids. Because the world talks like that or watches that show, then I can watch it. It's the number one rated show. It's okay if all it ever talks about is immorality. Every time my daughter and I have these conversations, it's like every show talks about dating or hooking up or, or this and that. It's, just, it's not our standard. We live by a different standard. And that standard... It's told to us in the Bible. Rick Warren, I read this quote from him, and it's just it's dead on. He said, the fundamental question 
you'll face in life is this. What will be your authority? And I ask you that question right now. What is your authority? Will it be God's word or the world? Will it be what God says is true or public opinion? You need to decide and you need to do it soon. The reason why you need to do it soon is because your mind and your opinions are being formed in fashion by those around you that do not adhere to biblical authority. Your teacher who's not born again does not care about biblical authority. They'll continue to teach evolution and Big Bang because that's what they were raised up in. That's all they know. They've not, they've not been exposed to the truth of God's Word and they know not better than what they've been taught. So we need to be ready. Just this week, the first GOP governor endorsed gay marriage. Listen, I don't, I don't care if Mother Teresa or Billy Graham endorsed it. It's not right according to God's Word. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? One of the reasons for marriage is procreation. Okay, children, young, young people, ask your uh, parents what that means later. Okay, be sure to over lunch in a crowded room. And so, procreation. Listen, I, I don't care how far science advances. Two men cannot have a child. Two women cannot have a child. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. And the purpose for marriage is procreation and pleasure. Can I get an amen from married folks? That's, that's the purpose of it. It reflects, it's a divine, it reflects a divine relationship with the Creator God. Yet, what does society say? Well, I was born that way. Those are my desires. Yes, we're born that way. We're all born with a desire to sin. Yours might be same-sex attraction. Mine's not, but it's the same result. It is a sin. It's something you must control. Men have many desires. It, your desire is same-sex attraction. You just want to give in to that. You think it's okay. Uh, I have a sister who uh, is, a, is lesbian. Uh, just because it's in my family doesn't mean I think it's right. Because what I believe is not defined on my experience, but it's based on the truth of God's Word. I love my sister. We've had incredible conversations through the years. But she knows where I stand because she knows I stand on the Word of God. And my love for her is not diminished because I call sin, sin. In fact, my love increases because I'm willing to say hard things because I love her that much. Because you see, friend, God loves you too much to leave you where you're at. God loves you too much to leave you stuck in that sin and that trap that's just going to lead to more guilt, more heartbreak. Hey, listen, some men have a desire to have multiple wives. I have no clue why, but they do. So, so should we justify that behavior in our society because they have that desire? Absolutely not. Listen, we're not talking about condemning the person. We're talking about behavior. And we do that all the time. We do it in our classrooms. We do it with our children. We do it in our laws. Polygamy is against the law because it's a behavior that we say is not acceptable. So then it becomes what determines what is acceptable and unacceptable. Most people say it's what's my personal belief. But as believers, that's not what we believe. We know it is the Word of God that establishes in our hearts and lives what is right and what is wrong. I like what a preacher long ago, he said. He said, listen, if we don't begin to say this is right and this is wrong, he says, an open mind is like a city sewer. It, it's meant to be closed on something solid. And if it's not, it becomes like that city sewer rejecting nothing. So if you just have an open mind, then you take in everything. All the garbage, just like a city sewer. Open minds are meant to be closed on absolute truth. We're not condemning a person, but we are condemning the behavior in your life and in my life. There's behavior in my life that is not acceptable to God. And I need to lay this, let God just fillet me open. And the Holy Spirit of God to get that junk, mess, and brokenness out of my life. And friend, you do too. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus says, Are you still so dull? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? In other words, he's talking to some Pharisees who said this. They said, look at the way they dress. Look at the way they act. They can't be Christians 
They've got tattoos. They have earrings. You know, they have holes in their jeans. They wear shorts to church. By their appearance, they must not be a believer. So Jesus is combating that here. He says, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. It's not the things on the outside, but those things that come from the heart that make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes what? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. We are called to live by biblical standards, not popular culture. I don't care if your mom said it was okay. I don't care if your Sunday school teacher said it was okay. If the Word of God doesn't say it's okay, it's not. And if you partake in that lifestyle, it's going to destroy you. It's going to make you miserable. It's going to separate you from God for all eternity. We need to get back to biblical standards, not public opinion. Well, how do we do that? Let me ask you another question. What weapons are you fighting with? Here in the text, Paul says, listen, we don't fight with the same weapons the world fights with. We don't use the same things. And in other words, he's saying, listen, if you want a successful campaign against the war on sin, you need to abandon the weapons of the world, and you need to begin to use the weaponry of the spiritual world. So so what are those weapons? What, What does that look like? Well, the weapons of the world, when they have problems. Turn to self-help books. At first thing, they get counseling's good, but it shouldn't be the first stop. They turn to alcohol. They turn to drugs. They turn to violence. They turn to another person. They turn to Facebook. They turn to blogs. They t- turn to hobbies. So when we have problems, we turn to these other devices and hopes it's going to bring some relief. But in actuality, it only masks the problem. We handle our problems differently. Paul says we have weapons that the world doesn't have. But understand, it's nothing innate in you. It's nothing that comes from you naturally. It's not working harder. That's what the world does. It's not reading your Bible more. It's not, it's not nothing you can do physically of yourself. It's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's nothing in you, but it's something supernatural given to you by God. And it's something that God gives us to destroy those strongholds in our lives. Let me list some of them. And these aren't on your outline, but I encourage you to write them down. As a believer, you're in Christ. Because we're in Christ, we have knowledge of God. And Paul says we take every thought captive. See, the battles happen inside our minds. And you need to understand that you're in Christ. You're free in Christ. You don't have to sin. You don't have to fall into that same temptation time after time. You don't have to keep on holding on to bitterness. You can let the anger go. You can turn the television. You can shut the cable off. You can defriend that person on Facebook. Because you're in Christ. You have knowledge of God. You need to understand who you are in Christ. Now You've been adopted by God. You have His power. You have all the resources of heaven at your disposal. Because you're in Christ. Another weapon we have is the Holy Spirit of God. As a believer, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. Do you not understand that? As a believer, the Holy Spirit of God was given to you as a deposit, guaranteeing the day of your salvation. The Holy Spirit is there to lead you. It's there to guide you. It's there to say, stop when you need to stop. And there to say, go when you need to go. The Holy Spirit is an ever-present help in time of need. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Another weapon we have is the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says the Bible is, the, is a sword. The Word of God is a sword that we fight with. We memorize Scripture. But to take every thought captive to Christ, we memorize Scripture. Where the Bible says in the book of James, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The Bible is what we go to to understand who God is, to have a relationship with God, to be closer to God. Another weapon is prayer and fasting. We fasted uh, during January for those 40 days and into February because it's a weapon for the supernatural. That when you pray and when you fast, supernatural things happen. You're delivered and you're free from sin. I tell you, during that time, I had so much freedom in Christ. And I know from talking to many of you, you experienced the same things as you fasted, as we came together as a church and we prayed. 
God brought victory in your life that you have not tasted for years. And it was sweet. And it was awesome. So you're struggling to tear down some of those strongholds in your life. You might need to fast. Jesus told his disciples when they were having problems in a certain area. He said, listen, some things only come out with prayer and fasting. So in other words, you have some struggles in your life. You have some strongholds in your life. The only way you're going to overcome them is by fasting. Listen, I don't, I, you know, I don't have any holy water to sprinkle over you. You know, my name ain't St. Francis. You know, I can't, there's no blessing that I can contain, you know, over you, chant over you, or nothing like that. No, it's some things you have to pray and fast in order to get relief from. Another weapon is confession. We talked about that briefly last week. The Bible tells us to confess our sins one to another. That when you confess your sin, it frees you from that which holds you. Confession brings in the light where darkness once was. We like to hide our sin. That's what the devil wants us to do. But God tells us to bring it into the light that it might be exposed and dealt with. You need to find someone that you trust. And and you need to confess your sins to them. And it will bring power in your life. Another weapon is purity and love. You know, it's easy. It's easy for the devil to develop a stronghold in your life when there's anger, hatred, grudges, resentment, annoyance. Maybe you're just annoyance with somebody. Somebody just annoys you. One of those extra grace required people. And so what the Bible says, and it's developed a stronghold in your life. You're so mad at somebody, you, you pass them. When you, you're going to KFC and they're going up to the vendor's market. And you see them and when you see them, you remember what they did. and You just begin to get angry and you begin to talk in your mind. and You begin to hope bad things happen to them. Yeah, you, I know how you are. You do. I mean, you're like, man, I hope they get a bad deal at vendor's market or whatever it might be. I hope they get a flat tire, you know, in Jesus' name or something. And, and it's, it's a stronghold in your life. You're captive to it. Because you know that person you just passed? They don't have a clue. They don't even know they upset you. They might not even know that they did you wrong. And they did you wrong. I'm not saying they didn't do you wrong. But friend, I'm I'm trying to open your eyes that you're the one captive. And And the way to break that stronghold in your life is to show love to them. Where there was once anger and resentment and bitterness... The weapon is love and is purity. Forgiveness is another weapon. You say, I don't want to forgive them. Jesus tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what he did. Paul tells us that, excuse me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we forgive others even when they don't ask for forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? When he sins against me. Up to seven times. And I I can't help but think. Peter thought he was doing good. You know. Because you and I. What what we we usually say is. You know. You know. Forgive somebody once. That's a good thing. So Peter says. I'm going to go up to seven. Seven's a good biblical number. And so he says. Jesus. How much should I forgive somebody. That does something wrong against me. Seven times. And I can almost picture Peter. Kind of just going by, crossing his arms and looking to the other disciples going, yeah, you were just going to say three, but I said seven. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times. And almost Peter going, yeah, I bet it was five. I like overshot. Jesus says 77 times, a number for infinity. In other words, and this is hard. This is tough. Whatever they've done, no matter how many times they've done it, Jesus says forgive, and it will set you free. You're you're a captive to what they did wrong. Holding on to, to bitterness from a child. Your dad wasn't there, what what a neighbor did to you. And I know it hurts, and I, I'm not trying to minimize it. I just want you to see. I want you to see again. I want you to feel again. I want you to know the joy 
of walking with our Savior. And the freedom that He offers. He who has been forgiven much, loves much. How much have you been forgiven? As a believer, you've been forgiven everything. And we are commanded to do the same. And unless, unless you unleash that weapon in your life of forgiveness and love, that stronghold will never leave. Let me give, give you another weapon. We've got to move on. Truth. You know, lies are used kind of as a technique for self-protection, for avoiding blame or embarrassment, or, or even to kind of promote ourselves. We will use lies, sometimes for convenience, for not having to own up to the truth. I remember when I was a boy and, and, uh, and I broke my grandmother's porcelain little doohickey. I don't even, she called them whatnots. I don't even know how you spell that. And, I, and, I, and she always told us not to rear in the house. You know what it means not to rear in the house? No, I don't either, but I, it wasn't. It was something we weren't supposed to do on the Davenport in my grandmother's house. Anybody know what a Davenport is? You know, I thought that was a city in, in uh, Virginia. And so she said, don't rear on my Davenport. And don't mess with my doohickeys, you know. And I broke it. I broke it. And so I did what any 12-year-old little boy would do. I hit it. I, I sweeped it up. And, and, and my cousin and I, and I left my cousin holding the bag. Because I went back to Louisville, left my cousin in New York, and she's the one that got in trouble for it. And then it was like, I came back to Grandma, and Grandma said, Alan, do you have anything to do with that? Do with what, Grandmother? Oh, you know. And I was like, oh, no, she knows. And, and so I began, well, I don't know. Tell me a little bit more, Grandma. What are you talking about? What, you broke my little doohickey. Is. What did that doohickey look like, Grandma? And, and so, you know, you're just kind of continuing down that road of lies and, and deception and gossip and slander. And it forms a demonic stronghold in your life. And the only thing that will break it is the truth. And you know, just like I did when I was a 12-year-old boy, what I was so worried about was my grandmother finding out. And then once underneath, I knew she had found out and she was confronting me in it, I wanted to pretend like I didn't know it happened and just sweep it under the rug. But then once it finally came out, and I said, yes, girl, I did it. I'm so sorry. I'll buy you a new one. And she said, it's okay. I didn't like it anyway. And it was like, and it, it was just a relief. Once the lie was revealed to that which I lied to, I was free. And it brought joy. It even brought an ecstasy. I mean, I, I was excited. I was relieved to go break something else by rearing on her Davenport. You know, I was, I was ready to go. That's what it will do. Number three. So let me ask you a third question. What are the strongholds in your life? What are the strongholds in your life? Strongholds, they're a fortress. They're well defended. The evil has entrenched itself in your life. Listen, we all have weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our life. Well, we all have a propensity to sin in certain areas than someone else has. So my question is, what is yours? Now, you don't need to raise your hand. You don't even need to write it down. But in your heart and your mind, what are the strongholds in your life? What is that sin that entangles you? What is that that always seems to trip you up? Well, these strongholds come because, one, of original sin. We all have a sinful nature. But also they come because of personal sins. And the devil, he is cunning. And he will exploit those temptations in our lives, those things that we succumb to so often. And it will set up uh, kind of a, a, a stronghold or a fortress in our life. It's something that we would do consistently. And then it becomes a habit. And then it becomes a bondage in our life. A, a demonic stronghold that is habitually exploited. He gains control of our thoughts and, and our emotions. On Sunday night, my wife's leading a great study called Unglued. Man, just kind of hearing some of that, we probably all need to take it. You know, you just come unglued sometimes. You know, it's, it's a barrier. It's a, it's a stronghold, a demonic stronghold in your life when you come unglued. It's the anger, man, that when we just explode. 
It's a beachhead that the devil has. And we've got to wage war against it. We've got to attack. We, we've got to go on the offensive. We can't sit back and just continue to let it happen. We've got to wage war. We've got to cut off the head of the serpent so it dies in our life. And what does Paul do? I love the imagery here. And this, this imagery just sent me all around the Bible. Finding the same imagery. Paul says we've got to tear it down. In other words, we can't hide it. We can't just walk away from it. Because this is what happens. We walk away from a sin, an argument. We walk away from gossip. You know, she calls at 8 o'clock every night. And, and your friend, she's always wanting to talk about the latest gossip, what so and so's doing. And you hear about this person. And, you, and, and the phone rings at 8 o'clock Monday night, and you just don't answer it this time. But then Tuesday, the call comes again, and, thir- and then by Friday, you're picking it back up. And you say, I'm just listening to it. Or you're being a, a gossip and a slander. Don't listen to it. You've got to cut off the head. You, you've got to stop it. You've got to tear it down. You've got to leave it behind. John Piper says this. The only possible attitude to out-of-control desires is a declaration of all-out war. And friend, that's what some of you need to do today. You need to declare all-out war on the sin in your life, on the strongholds, that they might be eradicated. That they might be totally demolished. demolished. And as Paul says here, they might be torn down. The first step to destroying a stronghold is realizing what that stronghold is. And then we need to do what Jesus says, figuratively in the Gospel of Matthew. He says if your hand causes you to sin, you need to cut it off. If, if, if your eye causes you to sin, you need to gouge it out. He says, better to, to go into heaven maimed than to be thrown into hell complete. Jesus says, declare war. Be serious about those strongholds in your life. Let me ask you a question. If you, if you had gangrene, okay, that, that's gangrene in your body and it set up, and the doctor said, listen, you've got gangrene and it's really bad in your calf, but it's kind of spread to some other parts of your body. And he said, you know, I, I don't want to disrupt your lifestyle so much, so let's just get part of it out. Let's just get the worst of the gangrene out and then go from there. Well, you wouldn't do that. You, say, you would say, no, you've got to get it all out. Or what if the doctor said, and all of a sudden you were diagnosed with cancer. The cancer was especially bad in, uh, in your lung, and, but he didn't want to take out your lung and because he knows you, you want to breathe. And, and so he says, let's just take part of it out. It, it spread to your uh, pancreas or whatever it might be. And he says, let's just deal with that. You would say, absolutely not. You'd find a different doctor. And yet that's how most of us deal with sin. We just want to get the parts out that really bother us. Where we get caught, where it disturbs our lives, we want to cut that part out. But we don't want to get rid of all of it. But how absurd. We need to begin to understand that sin is gangrene. That sin is a cancer. And it must all be dealt with. Unless you destroy its roots, it will grow back just like a locust tree. Locust trees, you know, the big thorns. I hate locust trees. You just have to cut them down. And you, the, the branches, the smaller the branches, the bigger the thorns. And a locust tree is very unique. And it has an underground root system that, that can go almost for miles. When, when you have a kind of a whole forest of, of locust trees. And you can, you can cut off the locust tree and have a stump. And you can even grind the stump down. But out in your yard, from the roots, you'll have little locust trees spout, sprout up. It's the same way with sin in our life. If you don't get it all out, if you don't get the root cause out of your life, it's going to sprout back up. Sin will show its prowess. And it will come, and it will show, and it will prove that it is your master. If you don't destroy it. You have to tell sin that you're the master, that you're in control with the spiritual weapons of God. You have a responsibility to tear down those strongholds in your life. I want to go to Judges, Judges chapter 6. And I can just read it to you, uh, or, or you can turn there. Judges chapter 6, and, and we're going we're to close with this. 
Judges chapter 6, we have a world that's gone amok. Much like the United States, uh, you know, sin is really no big deal. In the book of Judges, the, the refrain that you hear over and over again is everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does that sound familiar? It should. That's what we have happening in America right now. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And so God would bring punishment through another, uh, another country, come in and bring judgment on the people. They would turn back to God, repent of their sins, and then God would send a judge. One of my favorite is Gideon. And Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. And he's in a wine press threshing wheat so the Midianites don't see him and come steal all of his wheat. And so he's kind of hiding out in there. And an angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, Mighty warrior, which is kind of ironic. He's hiding out in a wine press. You know what I mean? You know, he's hiding. He's kind of ducked down in this wine press. And someone sees him and he kind of startles him and he jumps back. He says, Mighty warrior, I'm going to use you to deliver the people of Israel. And Gideon says, are you kidding? I'm of the least tribe. And not only am I from the, like the least family in Israel, but I'm like the least person in my family. And the angel of the Lord says, you're just the guy we're looking for because I'm going to do it in my power and my strength declares the Lord. But Gideon, there's something that needs to happen. Before I, I deliver the people of Israel... There's a stronghold. I, I need you to tear down. Now listen, Gideon, I'm going to take care of the Midianites. I will deliver you from the, their hand. But there's a barrier between me and you, says God to Midian. There, there's a stronghold. There's a sin that's taken root. And unless you tear it down and destroy it totally, freedom won't come. So beginning in Judges chapter 6, verse 25, listen to the words of Scripture. The same night, the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of its height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. This words that he, he says, tear down the poles. It's in Hebrew and its counterpart in the Greek. It's the same word that Paul uses in Corinthians. To tear down those strongholds. And he told Gideon, not only to tear down these idols, these strongholds, but he says, chop it up and burn the wood. None of it was to remain. Friend, that's what some of you need to do today. There is generational sin in your life. There's been divorce in your family and you're going down the same road even though you know, you know, you know. The Bible says with great clarity and without exception that God hates divorce. There is no occasion, not even adultery, for which God does not hate divorce. I can't forgive because of adultery and I guess God can't forgive you. Because the Bible says you've committed adultery against God. Every one of you, including myself, have committed adultery against God. And yet the Bible says, He will not leave me, nor shall He forsake me. So you're telling me you're going to leave your spouse? May God leave you. That's what the Bible declares. Look at David and Bathsheba. Look at that sin and what happens. Listen, you have to decide, are you going to tear it down? Or are you going to leave that altar up to a foreign God? I know you feel this way. Oh, yeah, God, yeah, I think God's given me clarity on that. If it ain't from the Bible, God's not giving you clarity. That's your own experience speaking. That's your own emotions dictating what you're going to do. So the question today is, will you tear down that stronghold? Or will you continue for generations to come? And friend, if you have kids or you have grandkids, if you don't tear it down, they will follow. They will follow every step of the way. God says, I will curse those who sins to the third and fourth generation of those that follow down that road. It is a promise from God. God doesn't declare it upon you as punishment. No, it's a revelation from God as a fact of what's going to happen. And some of you are just following your father's sins. You've, you've cheated on your wife. You cheat on your taxes. And as far as a religion is concerned, a faith is concerned, it's, I just go Sunday and it has no effect on my life because it had no effect on my father's life. Generational sin. 
But I believe today there are some Gideons in this place that will go to the Father's altar and they will tear down those things that your father was fearful to tear down. And you need to destroy those strongholds. Friend, you don't, you don't need drugs for your pain. Listen, it keeps you out of your mind. Listen, I understand. I, listen, I had surgery. I know there's a place for it. But for some of you today, it has you captive. Half of the day, you're out of your mind. You're not even in reality. You need to tear those strongholds down one day at a time with the truth of God's Word, following God every step of the way. So let me ask you again. What are the strongholds in your life? Is it unforgiveness? Luke tells us, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times a day comes back to you, says, I repent, then forgive him. You need to forgive today. You need to offer grace today. You need to flood this altar today and experience the mercy and grace of God anew and afresh. Some of you are afraid to get involved in ministry because of something that happened five, ten years ago. Perhaps you're afraid to join the church because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where they're going to go. You don't know what the preacher's going to do. Friend, God loves His church, and you're called to be a member of a church. And if you're not a member of a church, you're in disobedience. The Bible calls us to, to be in the game. The Bible calls us to be in ministry. Jesus said, go into all the world, declaring the gospel, baptizing, teaching them everything I've taught you. If you're not on mission for God, listen, you're not experiencing all that God wants for you. Listen, I know there's so many things I'm throwing out, but it's just because I love you and I care for you. And I see too many of you, too many of you captive, too many of you strongholds in your life. And it shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be. That today can be the day that that stronghold is torn down and the wood is chopped and offered to God in the offering today. But friend, you've got to be like Gideon. You've got to be the one that goes and says yes to God. And you take immediate action to tear that stronghold down. Today, not tomorrow, today. Alan, how do I, how do, I do that? You need to wield the weapons of warfare. You need to stand on the truth of God's word. Not what you think is right. Because you'll be wrong nine out of ten times. What does God's word say? That's what you're to stand on. You need to offer forgiveness even when it's not asked. You want to lavish love even when it is not warranted. You need to tell the truth even when it hurts. Tell the truth even when it costs you. And friend, I listen... You don't know this unless you experience it. But when you come clean, when you begin to follow God in faith, you will experience joy. You will experience a, a peace and a purpose like you've never experienced before. But I can, I can talk to you about it. I can share my own experience, how God has delivered me and how God has freed me. But you won't understand until you take that step of faith. Until you say yes to God. Until you take that immediate step of action. And begin to tear down that idol and that stronghold in your life. And I'm going to invite you to do it today. I'm going to invite you to tear down that stronghold today. Stay into your feet as we pray. Lord Jesus, God, we pray, God, for freedom. God, we pray uh, in your word. You tell us you've come to set the captives free. So, God, we believe that, and we just we declare that over the congregation today. And every person here, God, that you have declared freedom in their lives through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, God, I pray you give them the courage to say yes to you. God, habitual sin that has just developed a beachhead in their life, it controls them. Look, it controls their emotions and their behaviors, what they do and what they don't do. God, in Jesus' name, free them through the power of the cross. God, bring deliverance. God, you tell us you've canceled the written code. You've canceled our debt. God, let us walk in it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.